This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory of Chanoch ben Zlata, of blessed memory. May his soul be elevated in heaven. This week is an extra special podcast episode. As you know, the Parsha podcast has been on an unprecedented streak, and the current streak of not missing a single week, a single Parsha, a single episode each week, the current streak began last year on Parshas Re'eh. Parshas Re'eh is the next Parsha upcoming. We're up to Parshas 80 of this week. And next week's Parshas, Parshas Re'eh, meaning that this episode, this week's Parsha podcast, marks a year that we haven't missed a single episode. It is a tremendous accomplishment. And as I've said in the past, I don't think the credit goes to me. The success of the Parsha podcast is due to you the wonderful, amazing members of the Parsha Podcast family. And I specifically want to mention the generous donors who support our work at our organization, Torch. They support all the fantastic work of Torch and all the amazing podcasts we have with the help of the Almighty released over a thousand episodes to date across all the channels. And none of that would be possible without your support and incredible generosity. Thank you so much. We appreciate your friendship, and if you want to join the exclusive club of those who support the great work of Torch, visit torchweb.org. And of course, we really hope and pray that the Almighty will assist us in continuing the streak. This year, of course, marks the fifth year of the Parsha podcast, and since we began the new cycle, the new year, Parsha's Bracious, we have the amazing segment at the end of each episode, A and Q, please God, with the help of the Almighty, we will finish an entire year in this format. I'm thinking already now about how we're going to tinker with the format for next year. Of course, I will let y'all know. So let's begin recording from Canada. I hope you are well wherever you are. And as always, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. So in our parasha, we have a verse or a set of verses that really gets our attention. Chapter 10, verse 12. Moshe is in middle of his speech towards the end of his life, and he's reflecting on the past, and he is forecasting for the future, and he tells the Jewish people as follows. Chapter 10, verse 12, Va'ata Yisrael. And now, O Israel, ma Hashem imach, what does Hashem your God ask of you? Only to fear Hashem your God, to go in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to observe the commandments of Hashem and His decrees, which I commend you today for your benefit. The beginning of this verse really gets our attention. What does God want from us? This is a real hook. Moshe is promising to cut through all the noise, to get down to the bottom line, to discover and to tell us what it's all about, What does the Almighty actually want? The Torah, of course, broadly, is God's instruction manual for living. And now, Moshe is going to make the big reveal. He's going to tell us what God actually wants from us. What do we need to do? This verse, or these verses will be the subject of this episode, the one that completes the cycle, the one that completes an entire year without missing even one week, even one Parsha. We're going to begin with a very interesting and provocative piece that I saw for the first time this week that offers a very novel interpretation of these verses, and it really blew my mind when I read it. And I think the conclusion can completely transform our understanding of mitzvos and Torah and what we are supposed to try to strive and achieve in our lives. This is the first thing we're going to be discussing today. Secondly, we will, please God, examine a teaching in the Talmud related to these verses that contains an obvious question, and we will offer two ways to resolve that question. This is a very ambitious plan. Let's begin. So Moshe tells the Jewish people, I'm going to tell you a secret. What does God want from us? Moshe is going to simplify things. There's a lot of details. If you've been following the Torah 
till now, you know there's a lot of stories and a lot of commandments. Moshe is going to simplify things. Moshe is going to make it easier. I'm going to tell you what you actually need to know. And you read it. Okay, what's the answer? First thing he tells us, you got to fear God. And then it says you got to grow in God's ways. And then it says you got to love him. And then it says you have to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. And finally, you have to observe all the commandments and all the decrees that were given to us for our benefit. And I think this really raises a question. The beginning of Moshe's pitch, he tells us he's going to simplify things for us. What does God actually want from us? And it seems like there's somewhat of a bait and switch. He begins by seemingly coming to distill what it's all about, but it doesn't seem to be actualized in the end of the verse. He gives us a whole long list of things we have to do. You got to fear God, you got to love God, walk in God's ways, serve God. Oh, and you can't forget about any mitzvot, the mitzvot as well. You got to observe all of them. Moshe starts off and says, I'm, I'm going to simplify things for you. Don't worry about all the details. This is the bottom line. And then he doesn't seem to make things easier for us. Maybe they're even a little bit more difficult. Did Moshe sell us a bag of goods? That's a question we have to ponder. And this week, I saw an amazing piece from Rabbi Yosef Albo, who wrote a famous book from the medieval times called the Sefer Ikrim, which is a book about Jewish philosophy in general. And in section 3, chapter 31, I saw for the first time this week, it really blew my mind. He says the following. He says that, of course, we know that a human is a hybrid, is an amalgam of body and soul. And we're fused together. And these two opposite halves are fused together by divine decree so long as we are alive. And at some point in our future history, these two disparate parts are going to separate. And the body, please God, will be interred in the ground, and the soul will go back to where it came from in heaven. What is the destiny of the soul once it departs from the body? So, of course, we believe in the afterlife. We believe that your soul and your consciousness will live on beyond your time in this world. However, he reveals to us, the state of the soul at the time where it has an audience with the Almighty, that will determine the viability of that soul to flourish for all eternity in the afterlife. And the critical determining factor, the essential determinant as to whether or not a soul will be meritorious in earning an eternal share in the afterlife, in what we call olam about the world to come, what matters most is whether or not a person, when they're still alive, has acquired the traits of fear of God, love of God, walking in God's ways, and serving God. The first four things that Moshe lists those are the requirements. That's the criteria for a person to flourish for all eternity. But here's the problem. These qualities, they require a lifetime and more of very difficult work to try to achieve them. In fact, he brings an example. You know, the first thing the Moshe lists is fear of God. And Abraham after Abraham willingly offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice, the end of Abraham's 10 tests, chapter 22 of Genesis, God tells Abraham, now I know that you fear God. If you think about it, Abraham at the time is 137 years old. And he is a man with a very robust resume. He's already forfeited his life for God. He's already given up the comfort of the status quo and dedicated his life to disseminating the word of God in the world. Abraham is already a great person. And only now, 
At the age of 137, after all his amazing accomplishments, only now does the Torah testify, does God say about him, now I know that you have fear of heaven. So if Abraham, one of the greatest people who've ever lived, the patriarch, the founding patriarch of our people, the first popularizer of monotheism in the world, the person who exemplifies great character and the absolute exemplar of kindness. Remember the kindness they did with the strangers who turned out to be angels in chapter 18 of Genesis? If someone like that's got to work for 137 years until it could be determined about him that he fears God, What does that say about us? We are doomed. We have no chance. How will we merit a ticket to the afterlife? Do we have a chance? And here's the answer. The Almighty says, what do I want of you? I want you to achieve a ticket to eternity. That's what I want. That's why I put you here. I put you here so you could overcome those challenges and become a person who's worthy of the afterlife. I am going to make it easy. I am going to create a corpus of mitzvos, of commandments, that are going to include within them the precise instructions to achieve these qualities, fear of God, walking in God's ways, loving God, serving God, I am going to give you a cheat code. I am going to give you the ultimate shortcut to eternity. Instead of us following the Abrahamic route of trying to acquire fear of God independently and love of God independently and walking in God's ways independently and serving God with all our heart, with all our souls, independently. I am going to give you the specific instructions that you just color within the lines, you trace the letters, you follow the instructions to a T, and you will arrive at the very same destination. And this is the interpretation of the verse. What does God want of us? The Almighty, in His astounding benevolence, says, I'm going to make it easier for you. Really, you should have needed all these things independently. But God was kind and demanded just the mitzvos. Instead of needing to get fear of God, and instead of needing to walk in God's ways and to love God and all these things to serve God with all your heart, with all your soul, he only asks of you to observe the mitzvos and the decrees And these decrees and these mitzvahs he gave us for our benefit. Why? Because via the mitzvahs, we can achieve the goal of humanity, the goal of existence, the goal of priming ourselves for a ticket to eternity. This is an eye-popping explanation. Indeed, the verse is describing a way that the Almighty is making life easier for us. Really, we should have to work excruciatingly hard to reach the promised land. Abraham, he sweated for more than 100 years before he was labeled as a person who feared God. That's the way things ought to have been. But the Almighty infused all these end goals into a list of mitzvos that by merely doing the mitzvos, we're able to absorb and adopt all these amazing qualities and become worthy of being citizens of Olam Abba. Now, how exactly that works? How is that the mitzvos transform you? These are questions that are very difficult questions, very advanced questions. But I think it is very reassuring that there are end states of man that we must attain before we have an audience with God and the mitzvos transform us to being like that. That is the power of mitzvos. 
the nature exactly of how mitzvot interact with a person, how they transform us, what is the pharmacology of mitzvot? It's a very advanced question, and it is actually the subject of my upcoming book, please, that we're going to publish really soon. But according to Rabbi Yosef Albo, or according to the Sefer Ikrim, we see how they are shortcuts to achieving these end states of being a person who is worthy of eternal bliss in the afterlife. What an amazing thing. You know, we sometimes think that, oh, mitzvahs are so restrictive. They make your life so difficult. Try driving cross country while keeping kosher. It seems like that these mitzvahs limit our pleasure. You may even cynically think these are some evil machinations of a sadistic God. He wants to deprive us of a good life. But here we discover that mitzvos are shortcuts to becoming an angel, to becoming a person who can flourish for eternity. They are there. Mitzvos are there to make our life and our life's pursuit a lot easier. What does God want from us? All he wants is just the mitzvos. They are indeed the greatest cheat code in history. Now, if this was all that you got to hear about these verses, I think it would be worth the price of admission. But today's episode is a special one. We are celebrating the completion of an uninterrupted year of Parsha Podcasts, every single week for a year. In my opinion, a more impressive streak than Joe DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak, more impressive than Cal Ripken's streak, more impressive than the Lakers' 33 game winning streak in the 1971-1972 NBA season. Now, if you know nothing about American sports, that won't make any sense to you. And, of course, we have a very sizable international audience. So I apologize for that reference. But the short of it is, it's a monumental day. So we're going to plumb these verses a bit further. What does God want from us? What does he want from us? And the verse reveals to us, he wants us to fear him. And regarding this verse, there's an amazing teaching in the Talmud, the book of Brachos, page 33b. Amar Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina tells us from this verse that we see that Moshe tells the Jewish people, what does God want from us? To fear God? That reveals to us that everything is in the hands of heaven with the exception of fear of heaven. There are things that God wants from us because they're in our hands. Everything else he doesn't want from us because they're not in our hands. Everything is in the hands of heaven, aside from fear of heaven. An amazing introduction to the Talmud in the book of Brachos on page 33b, and it's already quoted by Rashi in his commentary on the Parsha. But then the Talmud continues, and the Talmud asks a question. Moshe is telling the Jewish people, what does God want of you? He only wants you to fear heaven. Wait a minute, says the Talmud. Is fear of heaven something easy? Don't we have a principle that God has in his treasure house nothing but fear of heaven? The only quality that fills the Almighty's treasure house is fear of heaven. It can't be something insignificant. It can't be something trivial. It's a very big deal. If someone has fear of God, that's a very exalted status. Why is Moshe framing it as something easy? What does he want from you already? It's so easy. Just fear. Fear? What do you mean? That's not easy. Is fear of heaven something easy and trivial? That's the Talmud's question. And the Talmud's answer is astounding. Says the Talmud. Is fear of heaven easy? Yes, it is easy. For Moshe, it's easy. 
Now remember, Moshe here is speaking to the Jewish people. For him, Moshe, the greatest man who ever lived, for him, fear of God, fear of heaven, is easy and trivial. It's a minor thing. Concludes the Talmud. It's analogous to a person who has a gold chalice. And someone says, do you have a gold chalice? And they say, yes, I have a gold chalice. If you have a gold chalice, then having a gold chalice is easy. And if you don't have a minor vessel, then if someone asks you, do you have any vessel? You say no, because then it's hard for you. Moshe is so great. He views fear of heaven as something very easy and very trivial. And therefore, he frames the Jewish people. What does God want from you? He wants you just to fear him. That's easy. That's eminently doable. That is the Talmud. So first of all, this whole idea of fear of heaven, we haven't even discussed it. What exactly it means. But on a very basic level, fear of heaven is some sort of vessel to harbor something. And it's compared to a gold chalice, a golden vessel, and thus maybe that is a little window into actually what fear of heaven is. But there's an obvious question on this Talmud. Moshe is telling the Jewish people, what does God want of you? All he wants is fear of heaven. That's not so hard. And the Talmud says, well, it actually is very hard. For Moshe, it's not hard. But for everyone else, it is hard. Moshe here is speaking to the people. For him, it's easy, but for everyone else, it's hard. Moshe is also a prophet. He's also someone who negotiates with angels. He split the sea and orchestrated a million miracles. I don't care that it's easy for Moshe. We're not Moshe. And Moshe is talking to us. For us, it's very hard. So what's Moshe doing here? Moshe obviously knew that he's an outlier, yet he is framing, when he's talking to us, he's framing fear of heaven as something very easy, very trivial, very minor. But to us, it's not easy at all. This quality of fear of heaven, that's what fills God's treasure house. And it's so precious to God precisely because it's difficult. And ordinary humans have a hard time attaining it. So why is Moshe telling us, what does God really want of you? It's nothing. It's easy. All he wants is fear of heaven. If it's only easy for Moshe, it's not helpful for us when he trivializes fear of heaven. Is that a good question? Is that an interesting question? We're going to share two amazing and adjacent answers. The first answer I want to say from my grandfather, blessed memory, and he says something incredible. He says that this Talmud is revealing to us how a teacher must operate. A teacher is someone who is more advanced than the student. And the teacher is there to inspire the student, to educate the student, but to really put the student on the path where they can flourish. And the teacher must model the behavior that they want the child or the charge or the pupil or the follower, the constituents, to emulate. And the way to do that is by accomplishing great things with ease. To show your underlings that the great things that they may be aspire to, to show them that they are eminently doable. Greatness to us is something that we view as being very difficult, being very distant from us. We have perhaps been conditioned to mediocrity. We're all comfortable with our status quo. But the truth is, that doesn't give us meaning. 
that doesn't make us feel like we're actualizing our purpose. And somebody who has achieved greatness, they know that. And their job is to get others on board. And the way they do that is to make it look easy. Moshe knows the fear of heaven is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that fills God's treasure house. He knows that. And he knows that it's very difficult for the Jewish people to get there. And he's trying to nudge them to believe in themselves. He's trying to encourage and coach them to aspire for that. And the way he does it is almost by making it look easy. Almost by trivializing it. And once they see that it's not so difficult for Moshe, they potentially could say, you know what? Maybe I could do it myself. For Moshe, it was easy. And he shares that with the people. And that makes it feasible for them in their head for them to believe that they could do it as well. Once they see something that's easy for Moshe, now it is within the realm of possibility for them as well. If you have a friend or a peer who does something, who accomplishes something that you would have thought that you cannot do, and then they do it, whatever it is, if they score really well on their test, if they get a very sought-after job, if they write a great book, or whatever it is. Once you see that, it makes it feasible for you to believe that you could do it yourself. Now you have learned that it's not so impossible. I know myself, several years ago, we were still living in Israel, I wrote a book in Hebrew on the Talmud. And thinking back on it, I think what inspired me to believe that I could do that was that I had a friend in the yeshiva who wrote a book on the Talmud. And I said, if he could do it, I could do it. And indeed, I did. Now, on the flip side, I have a difficulty with one of the books of the Talmud, the book of Erevin. I think the reason why I have such an aversion to studying it is because it was always presented to me as being so difficult. Oh, it's murderous. It's so hard Oh, to understand it. It's so impossible. And I think that got me spooked. And I think even decades later, I have this fear of going too close to it because it must be so, so difficult. So whoever inspired me to believe that it's difficult, I'm not blaming them. But maybe the correct approach was to follow what Moshe did. Moshe tells the Jewish people, fear of heaven? It's not so. What does God really want? Come on, it's not so difficult. You could do it. It's it's doable. By making it seem easy in his eyes, he is conveying a message to the Jewish people. You can do it too. A great teacher circumvents that. He has to model what the students may think is impossible for them to do, he has to make it look easy. Fear of heaven? Come on, it's easy. You could do it. That believe in yourself. Just do it. Moshe, of course, is the greatest teacher we've ever had. And he is taking maybe the most difficult thing for a human to accomplish, fear of God, as we've seen. That's the only thing that fills God's treasure house. And he is telling us it's easy. Truthfully, it's maybe the hardest thing we'll ever do But the only way we'll do it is if we believe that we can. And if Moshe tells us, oh, it's so hard, you'll never do it. You know what? That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Indeed, we never will do it. By telling us, it's easy, it's doable, come on, you could do it. Now we have a fighter's chance. That's, I think, a brilliant solution that my grandfather, a blessed memory, gives to the question of why Moshe would tell us it's easy when it's only easy for him and it's hard for us. The Sfas Emes offers another brilliant answer to this question. What does God want of us? All he wants is fear of heaven. Eh, No problem. That's easy. Says the Sfas Emes, Moshe is telling us 
It's not only easy for me, Moshe. It's easy for you as well. And he has an amazing callback to the episode of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. And we actually spoke about this uh, several months ago. At Sinai, the Jewish people said, Na'asev and Ishmael, we will do and we will listen. And the Talmud says that every Jew was endowed with two crowns, one for Na'asev we will do, and one for Ishmael we will listen at Sinai. And then the Jewish people did the synagogue calf. And angels came and swept away all those crowns and gave it to Moshe for safekeeping. And Moshe was the guardian, the placeholder of those crowns. He was temporarily holding and harboring the crowns for the Jewish people. He didn't acquire them for himself to keep forever. He was just holding them. He was the guardian until they were ready to resume ownership of these crowns. Now, these crowns the Jewish people got at Sinai. When they said, Na'asev and Ishmael, we will do and we will listen, which is a secret that angels know. This is an angelic statement. At that time, if you were to poll the Jewish people and you were to say, what are your thoughts about fear of heaven? Is it hard? Is it easy? When the Jewish people were at their peak, at their acme, at Sinai, like angels, what do you think they would have said? They would have said, fear of heaven? That's easy. And the problem was, is that that state didn't last. They lost it. They fell. They sinned. They blundered. They lost their crowns. They fell from their stature. But Moshe knew something that maybe they forgot. Moshe knew intimately what the nation was capable of. And it was a lot more than what they believed they were capable of. Moshe, after all, was still holding all their crowns. And his objective as a teacher was to try to give them back their crowns to try to coach them to unlock their potential that he knew for a fact they still had. And the Sfas Emes quotes a Midrash here. The Midrash says, Ve'ata Yisrael, the beginning of the verse, and now, O Israel, says the Midrash, Ve'ata, and now, that is a terminology of repentance. Moshe is trying to wake up the Jewish people. Wake up. Remember where you came from. Remember the stature you used to have. Remember the time when fear of heaven was trivial. The Jewish people were already outfitted with these crowns of glory and distinction. And the problem is that they forgot about it. They forgot that they were once wearing those crowns at Sinai. When we, like Moshe now, had fear of God instinctively, and it was easy, we had that state, and we just forgot about it. But Moshe never did. He knew our potential, and he was exhorting us to return to it. I want to give you back your crowns. And in that state, when you were worthy of those crowns, Fear of God was something totally easy and totally doable, not just for me, but for you as well. And that's what Moshe is trying to do. He's saying, yes, for me, fear of God is easy, but you know who else it could be easy for? For you as well. And Moshe is opening up a window for the Jewish people. And now Israel, return, return to where you came from. Return to the state where fear of God was trivial to you as well. I think there are three amazing takeaways from this podcast, from this Parsha podcast that marks the end of the cycle. Parsha's Akev, exactly a year from when the streak began. Three amazing takeaways on these verses, starting with chapter 10, verse 12 of the book of Devarim Deuteronomy. 
The first thing we learned is that mitzvos are superpowers. Ideally, we all have to get fear of heaven and love of God and walking in God's ways and serving God. And that's the only way we can be admitted into the afterlife. The only way we can accomplish our life's mission. But mitzvos, they are the particular set of vitamins and minerals, spiritual that is, spiritual vitamins and spiritual minerals that we need, the perfect cocktail to be able to achieve those qualities. We do them, that's all God wants of us, and we are transformed into angels, and we thus earn our ticket to eternity. And the second idea that we shared were the two ways that a leader coaches the most out of their constituents, how a leader is able to extract the potential from their charges. The first thing a leader has to do is to model the things that the charges can do, make it look easy, don't make it look hard. Once they think they can do it, once they think it is feasible, it becomes indeed such. Number one. Number two from the Fas Amis, a leader is someone who thinks about the potential of their charges, knows what that potential is, and nudges them to get back to their greatness. Now, of course, we have not even addressed the question of what fear of God even is. That's for another podcast, not this one, not the one that marks the completion of a cycle. And now, let's get to this week's A&Q. Answers and questions. And we are going to talk about Chapter 8, verse 1. The verse says as follows. Call ha mitzvah, all the mitzvah that I command you today, you should guard to do in order that you should live and you should flourish and you should come and inherit the land that God swore to give to your forefathers. That is the verse. And this is one of the themes that appears again and again. Moshe, many, many times throughout the book of Deuteronomy, throughout his speech, is encouraging and urging the Jewish people to adhere steadfastly to the Torah. But Rashi asks a question. Rashi says, wait a minute. It says, kol ha-mitzvah, which means all the mitzvah. It should have said, kol ha-mitzvos, all the mitzvos. Plural. It says, all the mitzvah. So what does that mean? So Rashi gives two answers. The first answer is, well, it says mitzvah, but mitzvah is like a category. It means all the mitzvahs. That's the first answer Rashi gives. The second explanation Rashi gives is based upon a midrash. U midrash agada. I'll give you an agadic midrash. When it says kol ha mitzvah, it doesn't mean all the mitzvahs, all 613 mitzvahs, commandments of the Torah. It is referring to all of a single mitzvah. If you start a mitzvah, do all of that mitzvah. Finish it. Because only when you finish it, is it attributed to you? And when it says call a mitzvah, it's referring to the concept of finishing a mitzvah, finish what you started, do all of it. Now, this idea of the importance of finishing the job when you start a mitzvah, finish it is found elsewhere. For example, Pinchas, a couple of weeks ago, we read he started the war with Midian and he was told to finish it. By contrast, Judah started saving Joseph, but he didn't finish it, therefore he was punished. So this is an idea we've seen in the past. This idea of doing a mitzvah in its entirety. Don't just do a half measure. Don't do half a mitzvah. Finish it. Call a mitzvah. Do all of a single mitzvah. And then Rashi continues. And he gives us an example. And quotes a verse in the book of Joshua, chapter 24. And Joshua, chapter 24, is talking about the bones of Joseph that Moshe took up from the land of Egypt. And it says that the Jewish people buried it. But the verse actually says something a little bit surprising. It says that the bones of Joseph, that the Jewish people brought up from Egypt, they buried in Shechem. But the problem is, is that the verse in the book of Exodus says that it was Moshe who took the bones of Joseph out of Egypt. It wasn't the whole nation. It was just Moshe. And in fact, the Midrash even says that everyone else was trying to figure out scrambling, trying to leave. And Moshe was 
trying to fulfill the promise of the Jewish people that they're going to f- discover the bones of Joseph and this uh, very interesting story of the Midrash that it was buried in the Nile. He had to find it. Moshe was the one who took the bones of Joseph out of Egypt, Moshe, and no one else. Yet, in Joshua 24, when it says the Jewish people buried Joseph's bones in Shechem, it says the Jewish people took it out of Egypt. Says Rashi, again, the Midrash, because Moshe didn't finish the job, because Moshe died before he entered the land of Israel, and the job was finished, the job of burying Joseph's bones, the job was finished by the Jewish people, they finished the mitzvah, and therefore it is attributed to them. So with the burial of Joseph's bones, Moshe did a half job. He took the bones out of Egypt, and he shepherded them throughout the wilderness for 40 years, but he didn't finish it. And therefore, it's not attributed to him. We're told in the verse that the nation brought Joseph's bones out of Egypt. So it seems like that Moshe is criticized for not completing the mitzvah, or at a minimum, he's not criticized, he's not praised for it, it's not attributed to him because he did not finish it. And here's the question for this week's A and Q. There's another mitzvah that Moshe did a half job, yet he is praised for it. He is commended for doing a half mitzvah. In last week's parsha, Moshe is commended for his mitzvah of designating the three cities on the other side of the Jordan River that would serve as sanctuary cities, cities of refuge, where accidental killers would go and flee and find refuge in. And the Talmud tells us that those three cities are only three of six. And Joshua actually designated the other three cities on the other side of the Jordan. And the three cities that Moshe designated on the east bank of the Jordan, they were not activated until the three cities on the west bank of the Jordan, in the land of Canaan proper, were designated by Joshua. Nevertheless, the Talmud tells us that Moshe loved mitzvos. And he was like a person who loved money and had an insatiable appetite for money. And just like someone who loves money wants as much as they can, Moshe loved mitzvahs and wanted as much as he can. And then he said, you know what? Mitzvah, the opportunity that I have, I'm going to designate the three, even though I can't do all six. So we see seemingly a contradiction. There are two instances where Moshe did half a mitzvah, did the beginning of a mitzvah, but didn't finish it. And in one instance... He is criticized, or at a minimum, he's the example of someone who's not being praised, even though they did the beginning of the mitzvah, because they didn't finish it. The bones of Joseph, Moshe began, but didn't finish it, and therefore it's ascribed to the Jewish people as if they did the beginning. Moshe's role is ignored, is omitted. Yet with the other mitzvah of designating the cities of refuge, Moshe is praised for starting the mitzvah, even though he didn't finish it. That's the question. That's this week's a and for an answer. Send me an email, rabbiwobajima.com. Now, last week, we asked the question of why only Moshe prayed to have the decree barring him from entry to the land of Israel annulled. Why did only Moshe pray and not Aaron? Why did Aaron take this sitting down? Of course, there are many answers. But we mentioned last week that we will talk about the Megala Amukos' answer in approach number 28. And he says something really fascinating and really striking and really interesting and something that we have to wait till the end of the podcast where only the diehards are still listening. He says that Aaron foresaw prophetically that his soul is going to be reincarnated in the soul of Ezra. Ezra, indeed, bore the same soul of Aaron, and therefore Ezra is going to enter the land. And Aaron said, you know what? I'm not going to make a big fuss about it because in my next go-round, I'm going to have an opportunity to enter the land. Whereas Moshe, who was not reincarnated in a second iteration or even in a different iteration, shall we say, because according to the Kabbalist, Moshe is actually himself a reincarnation of someone who existed previously. Moshe wanted to enter, and he wasn't allowed, not 
in its current state and not even as a reincarnated state. Now, I'm not giving you the full story because the Megala Mukos in approach number 28 says other really interesting and really striking Kabbalistic things. If you want to see more, you got to look inside yourself. But I will tell you that my brilliant brother-in-law, Shmuley Botnik, he calculated that the word Ezra is the same gematria as the first two words of Aaron's blessing, Yevarechecha Hashem. So that's the brilliance of my brother-in-law, Shmuley Botnik. But that's the idea. And it's kind of a crazy idea for us who are not used to thinking about things in terms of reincarnation and souls coming back. And of course, whenever we talk about these things, we have to admit, we don't really know what these things mean. It's very Kabbalistic. It's very advanced. But I found it interesting. That's why Moshe prayed. Aaron said, okay, I'll come in next time. No big deal. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Parsha podcast. I thank you for listening. And I really appreciate to have the finest audience in the entire podcast ecosystem listen to the Parsha podcast, supporting us throughout the street. Please, God, with the help of heaven, it will continue. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day, a fantastic and splendid and stupendous and marvelous Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.